Thanks for coming today, everyone. Uh, so, as he mentioned, I want to talk today about achieving altered sword with P. What does that mean? And the answer is, it doesn't mean anything because that's not what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about is, what if we rediscovered play? I was playing with you there. This concept of play in our lives, we learn it as children, uh, but we somehow lose it as we get older. And so, I want to tell you how I took uh, this, this concept of play, the, the play pattern, and apply that to a passion of mine uh, to, to, to bring it to, to me being a professional at that thing. So, to do this, I've got to rewind back to my childhood. So, I played with toys. We all played with toys growing up. I had three siblings, two sisters, one brother. My sisters played with girl toys like My Little Pony and Cabbage Patch Kids, and my brother played with... Uh, G.I. Joe's and He-Man, as, as did I, but I was kind of weird. I couldn't just have one He-Man. I had to have all the He-Man, He-Men. I couldn't just have one Transformer. I had to have all the Transformers, all the Autobots, all the Decepticons. I was a collector at a very young age. In short, I was an addict. And as you know, any addict knows you have to have money to support your habit. And so at a young age, I became an entrepreneur. Lemonade stands, mowing lawns, I would get uh, spray, spray cans and stencils and walk around the neighborhood and offer to re repaint people's addresses for 5 to $10 a piece. And uh, this spirit of entrepreneurialism, uh, entrepreneurialism continued into my later years. So when I graduated high school, I moved to Amarillo, Texas and started one of the first cell phone dealerships. And this was back when cell phones were between 5 and 10 pounds a piece. Uh, $250 a month would get you about 10 minutes of airtime. So I made a lot of money at that. Uh, then moved to mortgages. I started a mortgage company with a friend of mine in the early 2000s, made some good money doing that. From there, uh, kind of took a left turn and worked for a company called Funimation, uh, who's most well known for uh, Dragon Ball Z, an animated series and a lot of other series. And so from there, I started my agency, Media Juice Studios. And Media Juice, as he mentioned, we produce game trailers, TV commercials, primarily for video game companies and toy companies, uh, like, like these guys here, Capcom, Atari, these are some of our, our clients here. And so uh, three or four years into uh, Media Juice, things were going really well, business was good, but I, I had a personal crisis. What happened is I stumbled on this book, Save the Cat, in spring of 2007. Save the Cat is a, a kind of a tutorial on, on screenwriting. And I had never seen what I did at Media Juice or what I do at Media Juice as, as, uh, as movies, as filmmaking. I saw it as work. It's creative work and fun work, uh, but still work. And so I saw this huh, screenwriting. I've, I've, I've heard about this, but I didn't have any concept for it. So I bought the book, and over a weekend, I read the book cover to cover. And when I finished reading it, I read it again, this time taking notes. Uh, in short, I, I was bit with, with the filmmaking bug and I had a problem. So we all have jobs, and we, you might have a passion on the side, but you can't quit your job to pursue your passion, or you shouldn't. I was the same way. I couldn't just stop working, close my agency, and go to film school. That wasn't an option for me. So what did I do to solve this personal crisis? And the answer is, I embraced a spirit of play. A spirit of play is what, is what took me from, from this being a crisis uh, to being a solution for me. So, let's talk about play. I want to talk about play and work and then synthesize the two. Play is a natural part of life. Every child plays uh, in different ways, but there are seven types of play, and I want, to, I want to take you through those seven types of play. The first type, my slides will work with me here, the first type is attunement play, and attunement play is just what it sounds like. It's getting in tune with another person, so it's a newborn uh, and, and, and their mother. It's, a, it's a, a lion cub and its mother. It's getting in tune through personal connection. That's the very first type of play. The second type of play is body play. So a baby is, is learning their equilibrium, learning their balance, uh, scraping their elbows and knees, and they're figuring out the body that they live in and playing with it. The next type is object play. So this is the type of play that we all most closely associate with play. It's, it's actually playing with objects, blocks, Legos, toys, uh, some kids, you know, spoons and forks. Uh, the next type of play is social play. So up to this point, play has been between uh, two, 
the mother and, and the baby or the baby itself. And now it expands with an activity to one or, or, or more people into, into a social activity. The next type, escalating, uh, is pretend play. So pretend play is Johnny and Sally, uh, you know, want to be a pirate and a princess. From there, we go to storytelling play. Storytelling play is Johnny and Sally want to be a pirate and a princess in an environment, on the moon, on an island. There's now a story being told socially. The next, the, the highest type of creative play, kind of the maturation of all of this, is what's called creative play. And this is where the child or adult imagines something that doesn't exist and plays that out. So most famously, Albert Einstein had these, these creative play sessions where he would allow his mind to go into areas uh, of scientific endeavor that had never been proven, that had never even been thought of. And so what did he come up with? He came up with the theory of relativity, which is one of the, the greatest breakthroughs in science ever. And I should say, uh, through creative play, through this space where you're imagining coming up with scenarios that don't exist, some of the greatest output of humanity, some of the greatest films, some of the greatest plays, some of the greatest songs have come from this space of creative imaginative play. So we've talked about play, now I want to transition to work. So we see that play is a primal part of life. Work is a necessary part of life. We all have a job we have to go to. So now let's look at the history of work. I'm sure you've seen this in one of your history classes here. So a brief history of work. We've gone from hunter-gatherer to farming to, to the Industrial Revolution to the Information Age. But more specifically, I want to look at the relationship between work and play or free time throughout the ages. So back to hunter-gatherer, you look in blue, that's the amount of time spent on work. Red is the amount of time spent playing or free time. So you see uh, poor Mr. Hunter-Gatherer really has no free time at all. All of his time is spent literally surviving. We, we graduate to, to now farming. So farming, we, we've got uh, seasons, seed time and harvest. So there's a little time off uh, to do something, to play, to, have, uh, to, to, to uh, embrace extra, extracurricular activities. From there, we go to the Industrial Revolution. So now, for the first time during the Industrial Revolution, we've got machines doing our farming for us, machines doing other things for us. So for the first time, we've actually got a block of free time to play or to do with what we, what we will. And then we fast forward to all the way where we are now, the information age, the technology age, where we have machines and technology literally doing almost everything for us. And we have the greatest amount of free time, of play time now than in the history of human existence. So what can, we, what can we synthesize from this? Let's rewind back to 2007, my personal crisis. I've got this passion. I want to be a filmmaker. I want to make movies. I'm, I'm, I'm reading about screenplays and how to do screenplays. But I can't quit my job, so, so what do I do? I embrace the play method. So I'll, what I want to do is take you through the play method and how I apply that in my life as, as an aspiring filmmaker. So as we discussed before, attunement is the first type of play. So how did I use attunement play uh, as an aspiring filmmaker? And, and the answer is that the very first step was reading that book, this, the book on screenwriting. Screenwriting is, is the nucleus of filmmaking. Any filmmaker would tell you that's the most important thing. It's been famously said, if, it, if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. So you have to learn screenwriting if you're going to be a filmmaker. So I had to get, get in tune with, with, filmmaker, or with uh, screenwriting. The next type of play is body play. So if you translate that to filmmaking as an aspiring filmmaker, how did I embrace body play? Well, I very literally had to, to reintroduce myself to the body of cinema, but this time through the eyes of an aspiring filmmaker. So I'm learning about screenwriting, about dialogue, about, about uh, transitions, scene descriptions, re-watching all the classics like Citizen Kane, Gone with the Wind, all the way up to where we are now. I'm re-watching uh, uh, films and re reintroducing myself to the body of cinema. The next type of play is object play. So this is what it sounds like. In filmmaking, the objects of movie making are cameras, lenses, lights, dolly tracks. I had to familiarize myself with those things. So thanks to American Express and Visa, I, I bought some equipment and uh, started learning. And the good news now with this point here, I want to make to any aspiring filmmaker or artist, musician, all the tools are out there. So if you want to learn you know, the objects of, fil of filmmaking, cameras and lights, uh, and how to use them. The tutorials are there, they're online, they're available for anyone, so that's what I did. I, 
I learned through tutorials and taught myself. So let's look at the next type of play, social play. There's really no uh, uh, portion of the arts that's more social than filmmaking. You have to learn to work with a cast and a crew. And so through writing short films, I, I'd learned screenwriting, so I was writing short films. I went out and shot those short films, had to learn to work with the crew, the gaffers, the lighting technicians, assistants. You have to l learn to work with the cast, uh, get their performances. So I embraced social play. Pretend play, so this, this one seems pretty obvious uh, in filmmaking and movie making. It's all about pre pretend. So uh, you've got to know those characters and that world better than anyone else because if you're directing, you want to make sure when you're in the edit editing room, you're getting what you want. You want your vision to come across, so you have to know that pretend world better than anyone else. And then storytelling, which is really the, 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 uh, the maturation of all of this, is storytelling. You are the storyteller, so I had to embrace storytelling play and, and play that role of being the storyteller in every sense, knowing the locations, knowing what the crew's doing, knowing the cast, knowing their roles, getting the performances, and then this all synthesizes to creative play. So how did I take something that didn't exist as, a, as an aspiring filmmaker, and I should mention this process here was, happened over about five or six years of, of learning and teaching myself, embracing the play method, and so as of about 2011, I decided that I was, or I felt that I was ready and mature uh, to shoot my first feature film. So that's what I did. I, I had an idea to shoot a movie about the history of video games, the history and the industry and the culture of gaming, which had never been done before. It was an idea I had, but it was something that didn't exist in the world. And so from 2011 until 2014, uh, that's what I did. I, I shot this film. It's called Video Games the Movie and I'm gonna let you take a look at it right now. My first console I remember playing was the Atari 2600. I remember saying like, wow, look at the graphics. I never thought it would mount to anything. He informs us they wanna pay those $30 million. It was like, what? Video games vastly differ from every other kind of media. A good video game is probably the hardest thing to make. The whole point of a game was literally shooting pixelated aliens that were falling out of the sky. Nowadays, not only do we know why those aliens are falling out of the sky, we know the names of their moms. And we know we have to destroy all of them. They've evolved into truly global experiences. It's a borderline religious experience. And just something about blowing your friend in half, nothing is more satisfying. I have lifelong friends that I've met just playing together online. This is the ultimate example of art and science working together. It's making a movie times a thousand. Back in the early days, we really did look forward to a day where video games would be interactive movies. Video games in the next 30 to 40 years are going to be unimaginable, where you can live the dream that you've always wanted to live. That, that's a concept that, uh, that had never been realized into a feature film. Uh, a lot of people may have had that, had, had that idea, but it, it had never been realized in, into a film. So that's what I did. Uh, it's something that exists now. I think my slides to work with me here. Whoop. One more time. Um, so w w what's the challenge here? We talked about play was primal. Play is something that we all know and it's part of our lives and that work is necessary. But I would argue that play is necessary. And in all of your lives, in your work, your careers, if you've got a passion that you want to pursue, embrace the play method and you can, you can, you can do it. Uh, you, can, you can come up with something that didn't exist before, and if you don't have a passion, I would encourage you to, to pursue one and, uh, and make your dreams come true. Thank you.